So again, due to some extenuating circumstances, I was still thinking about my introduction for this at about 3.30 this morning. Um, so I was going to tell Mark that the dog ate my introduction, but I, that, I knew that wouldn't work. But uh, anyway, God is good. So yeah, uh, I was thinking about God always keeping his promises and thought about Simeon in Luke chapter 2 listed only as a righteous and devout man to whom the Holy Spirit had promised to show the Messiah of Israel before he died. God kept that promise, and Simeon held the baby Jesus in his arms that morning in the temple. In a prayer of praise, he called Jesus a light of revelation to the Gentiles. I was kind of surprised by that when I looked at that. That's where he started, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Scripture never mentions Simeon again, and I'm sure he didn't live, well, I shouldn't say sure, but I'm pretty sure that he didn't live to see Jesus crucified. It made me wonder whether or what he would have thought had he lived that long, having seen the Messiah of Israel and to see him crucified. The truth is that God, because of his, oops, there we go, his amazing knowledge and wisdom has made a way to keep his promises for salvation both to the Jews and to the Gentiles in some unexpected ways. So we'll look at our, those in our text this morning, so please turn with me to Romans 11, 25, and 26. So before we start, though, let's talk about how we got there to, to the text this morning. Up to that point, Paul had written eight chapters of amazing doctrine outlining what true salvation is all about. He covered it all. But when he gets to chapter 9 through 11, instead of you know, telling us how to live, like here's all the doctrine, uh, now here's how we should live, he breaks out of that to do what? His heart for his own countrymen, the Jews, takes over for a bit and he speaks to the Gentiles in Rome about that. We are all also Gentiles here, right? I take it, unless there might be a Jewish person in the audience today, but I believe we're probably all Gentiles. So in that respect, Paul is talking to us this morning as well as the church at Rome. Roman history tells us that the church at Rome was almost entirely Jewish for the first 10 years. That's kind of surprising when we think about the church as it developed, but for 10 years, almost entirely Jewish. And due to the conflict between the Jewish Christians there in Rome and the non-believing Jews over whether Jesus was really the Messiah, Emperor Claudius finally got tired of that and he kicked all the Jews out of Rome. This left the church at Rome in the hands of a few Gentile believers. So that was kind of different. Soon hundreds of Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ and the size of the church exploded. But then after Claudius died, Nero repealed that Jewish expulsion law that he had made, and the Jewish Christians slowly started to return back into the church, but it was now a Gentile version. And if you can imagine, you know, if we had left our church to go somewhere for five or six years and came back, and it was totally everyone different, larger, it might be a little different experience for us. What, where did my church go? And soon after that even, the Gentile believers were starting to become arrogant toward the Jewish Christians saying things like, gee, I can't believe you guys crucified your own Messiah. And they were making fun of them because they still kept the Jewish Sabbath, obeyed Jewish food laws, worshipped in Aramaic. This caused quite a bit of tension, as you could imagine, in that congregation then. And I think that's one of the reasons Paul addressed the situation like he did in the book of Romans in this nine, chapters 9 to 11. The place where we are in chapter 11 is the summary of what he's been talking about in chapters 9 through 11, kind of a parenthesis in the book. So why is he revealing this mystery at this time? And just a quick word on that word mystery. That became my word in the, our Bible study methods class in the in spiritual growth process, so that stayed with me, it was, and it's something I've pursued all the way along. So the word mystery, mysterion in the Greek, is used about 22 times in the New Testament. 
but informing us of really more about uh, seven specific truths. I just want to give two as an example, and then we'll look at our text for today, our mystery. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul said that he wanted to fully carry out the preaching of God's word. So in 126, he says, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, that is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that, that was the revealing of the mystery. It was that Christ would live in us as believers. It's awesome. And you can also see the principle there that's given by Paul about mysteries in the New Testament, hidden in the past, but revealed now. Paul would say, uh, in a New Testament sense, a mystery is not a thing concealed, but a truth that was hidden and now revealed. And then one other example of a mystery, Brad, you'll like this one. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Awesome. In other words, the transformation of living believers' bodies at the resurrection. So those are two mysteries. The actual indwelling of Jesus Christ in the believer wasn't really known in the Old Testament, but is now. And secondly, our instantaneous transformation in our glorious bodies at the rapture or at the resurrection. Some of us may not make it to the rapture. Sometimes I wonder if I'm going to make it, but... Uh, <laughs> Either way, we're going up to be with the Lord. Instant transformation. But what about today's mystery then? Let's look at it in Romans chapter 11. We'll start with verses 25 to 27. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This, God says, is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Again, we're at a summary point in this chapters 9 to 11. So it's kind of compressed, condensed, trying to bring home all the things that he had been talking about. And I would encourage you maybe at some point... Go home and read those chapters. Read 9 to 11 and see how it gets to where we are. So to start with, Paul gives the reason why he's telling the Gentile Christians at Rome about this truth. He doesn't want them becoming arrogant against the nation of Israel. If you think back, as we talked a little bit about that history, that was starting to happen in the church at Rome. They were starting to do some put down on the, the Jewish Christians there and against the nation of Israel even. So he solidifies in one statement what he's been telling them since, chap since 9 verse 1, that national Israel still has a future. Praise God for that. And there is resistance to this, to, to Israel's future, I believe sourced from Satan, who has hated Israel and tried to destroy her clear from the beginning. And if they and we don't understand this, we could also become haters of national Israel. You say, how could that be? Well, obviously, the long history of this has been documented down through the centuries. Jews have been chased, hated, killed all over Europe, Asia. In the Holocaust, we saw it as beginning a resurgence, even today. We see it in our own country in this BDS movement that's been around now for seven or eight years. I believe the boycott, divest, and sanction movement against Israel. It's an official movement. You can find it all over the internet. Sadly, some of what that sentiment has been helped along by Christian theology. I've been reading a book lately recommended by John MacArthur entitled Future Israel. The subtitle of that book is Why Christian Anti-Judaism Must Be Challenged. It's a great book. I'm probably three quarters of the way through. It is documenting how even in the church we have our theology has turned us away from 
recognizing a future for Israel. In it, the author Barry Horner documents that turning against Israel and their theology clear back as some of the early church fathers. Augustine tainted some of the theology of Scripture with that idea. It's been maintained through Roman Catholic doctrine down through centuries of that church and uh, is present even in some of our own Christian theology today. We must not allow this to take hold. So as Paul warns, let us not become wise in our own estimation. Our own human wisdom isn't worth anything when it comes to God's truth. We need to hear what he says. So what is this mystery that he wants to make clear to them and to us? It's a time statement. He says, until God's plan is to allow for a time of salvation in this age for the Gentiles, after which he will finish his plan with Israel, resulting in the salvation of all living Jews at that time. And I would emphasize living Jews. There is coming a time in that great tribulation period where uh, the Jews are going to suffer greatly, and only the ones who are left will be saved. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now at that time Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, that's Daniel's people, the Jews, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. So again, he's talking about the Jews, but he's also talking about only those written in the book of life. And I think we understand what that's talking about when the New Testament talks about the book of life. It says only those who are saved are in that book. Anybody not found written in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. So that, that book contains those who are saved. And so a, a Jew is in there, a Gentile is in there, they're saved. In verse 25, it says there's a partial hardening has happened to Israel. So what does he mean by that? He means that some Jews from the day of Pentecost at the birth of the church have rejected their Messiah. Only some. They have hardened their hearts towards Christ, even down to this very day. We know that Israel is in their land, but nationally, they're in unbelief. It's obvious to look over and see that the nation of Israel is not devoted to Jesus Christ. They have not fallen down before him as their Messiah. They're there in unbelief. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13, 46 say, or Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, talking about the Jews, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So the other part of that mystery then is the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. And praise God for that, being Gentiles. And this isn't to be confused with the times of the Gentiles. In Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, and talking about the Jews again, they will fall by the edge of the sword, they will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. These times began, as Daniel prophesied, with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, talked about in Daniel's prophecy. Rome is still hanging around. That Rome will be revived at the end to play their part. But the times of the Gentiles represents an unbelieving world system that we are still in that is brought to an end in Revelation 19 at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to destroy the wicked, including this system, and to set up his kingdom. Paul is not talking about that in this passage. He's talking about God's saving work among the Gentiles during the church age, which will be ended at the rapture of the church. During that same time as this partial hardening is continuing with Israel, God is calling out to Gentiles for salvation. Acts 15, 14 says, Simeon, and that would be Simon Peter, has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. So praise God. God has made a place for us in his whole plan, his awesome plan. So as a Gentile myself, 
I praise God for this grace. I praise God that it lasted as long as it had. It's been almost 2,000 years. I don't know the exact number, but if it wouldn't have lasted as long as it would, I wouldn't have made it. It's been a long time, but God's door is open for the Gentiles still. Thank God. But the revealing of this mystery tells us that God has set the time when this grace will become full and that door will be closed. So he says a partial hardening of Israel. There's been a remnant of believing Jews all through the centuries that God has kept and that have embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Messiah. Paul uses two examples earlier in chapter 11 of why it's obvious God hasn't rejected all of Israel. First of all, he says that he himself, Paul, is a Jew. He was saved. God worked in him, saved him. And second, in uh, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 11, it talks about Jeremiah's story. And I think we remember Jeremiah, and he, he was a great prophet of God. He stood up and told a you know, strong truth for God back in his day. He represented God to Israel and to the surrounding area. But he said that he was, but he experienced a lot of trouble as well, even from his own countrymen, the fellow Israelites. And he says, in effect, Lord, I'm the only one left. I'm all alone with you, God. What, what are you doing? Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that I would have been right along with him in the whining category but with that trouble. But God sets Jeremiah straight to saying that unbeknownst to him, God has kept a remnant of 7,000 faithful saved Israelites who had not worshipped the phony god Baal. So keep that word remnant in mind. It's important. When Paul says a partial hardening, he means that not all of the Jews have rejected God's truth, only a part. A faithful remnant of Jews down through the ages have been saved, kept by God. Okay, so we have a part of the Jews who have continued to reject, but this is a time statement until, until when? It's a point of history that we have not yet reached. We've talked about the fullness of the Gentiles, and again, praise God for that. That includes us if we believe, but then what? Since we've seen our part as Gentiles, let's bring on a little Gentile humility. Can you handle it? <laughs> as I've thought about it, it seems to me that almost, did you say yes? Was that? Yeah. I could, all right, good. As I've thought about it, it seems to me that almost all of Scripture is about the Jews. First, okay, first we have creation in the flood, total destruction of the human race, minus eight. Okay, so that's not the Jews. But then we get to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. That's Israel, the start of Israel. They are the forefathers of the nation of Israel. The rest of the Old Testament, almost all of the Gospels, and most of the book of the Revelation are Jewish in scope as well as much of the, uh, the epistles. Almost every single writer of Scripture is Jewish. Our Lord and Savior, in his pure, sinless flesh, is Jewish. We as Gentiles only got one apostle. That was the Apostle Paul, the 13th apostle. And he was a Jew. So granted, he, he, may, not, he may have been the most preeminent apostle, so we did get him in that respect. But he didn't think that. And not only all of these, if that's not enough, the New Covenant was written to the Jews. We talk about the Old Testament, the New Testament, the new covenant written to the Jews. So are you feeling the burn yet as a Gentile? I hope so. Listen to Jeremiah 31 and that new covenant thing. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That'd be the Mosaic covenant, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And I think you made it clear, pretty much clear through those four verses. The Lord was declaring these things. 
And I don't believe this has happened yet. God's purpose all along has been the salvation of Israel. In Acts 5.30, we read, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom we had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So my point is that God has always had a plan for Israel. We as Gentiles were given the grace of being grafted into that. It didn't start with us, it started with them. We weren't owed it, we didn't deserve it, but praise God, he is merciful and gracious and has brought us in to that. So I believe the mystery mainly is that the Gentiles are also granted salvation to a select number, and when that number is full, God will resume his work with Israel. So, well, then, what is that work that we're talking about? I think we can see both a physical and a spiritual salvation at work here. He says that all Israel will be saved, and the deliverer, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the center of everything. The Old Testament prophets are full of references to Israel and their salvation. I've got one here. I could have quoted 30 as I did the study on it. Jeremiah 32, 37, and I apologize, my slide's a little dark at the bottom, but we'll read it. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. I will make them dwell in safety, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart, one way, that they may fear me forever, I lost my place here. Hmm. For their own good and the good of their children after them, I will make them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. That's God talking. That's a pretty amazing statement right there. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promise. So Israel, if they get the bad, they also get the good. The wrong theology is that Israel gets all the bad, the church gets all the good. It's not right. It's not true. God is a promise-keeping God, is he not? Amen. Even clear back as far as Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, he talks through Moses to say, when you are in distress, talking to Israel, and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. He will not forget the covenant, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. That is not the Mosaic covenant. Salvation for Israel in this context is a forgiveness of sin and a new heart, just like us Gentiles. No Jew is getting a pass just because they are a blood Jew. It's because they have a changed heart just like us. Deep repentance, hatred of our own sinfulness, And as a desire to ever after please God comes along with a salvation that he gives. No Jew will be saved apart from these truths. It would include a full and repentant acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and as their God. Couldn't and shouldn't we be rejoicing in this? Shouldn't we pray for and rejoice for the salvation of Jewish people? not be hardened to them ever, but to pray for their salvation. So thankfully, we along with Paul are working to bring the gospel message to Israel through giving and prayer support of our own missionary to the Jews. I I was encouraged this morning when I sat here and Mark brought up the the picture of Olivier Melanick. I was like, praise you, God, thank you for that. We're talking today about Olivier and his message and, and missionary to the Jews. That is awesome, and I'm glad we are supporting that. 
So let's move on then to some supporting theology in verses 28 to 32. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also now may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may have mercy to all. So this is a little bit tricky of a passage. It kind of goes back and forth. It can be confusing to, to think through it. But I think it follows the flow of the earlier text. It shows that a temporary condition, it shows a temporary condition and then a permanent one for Israel. It follows that hardness in part, then full salvation that comes to Israel pattern that we saw earlier. So he says from the standpoint of the gospel, they are temporarily enemies for your sake. For whose sake? For us, for our sake, for the Gentiles. Right now, many Jews are not believing the gospel, so God has decreed a time for us Gentiles to receive mercy, and some will believe. But that's only temporary, like we talked about. Our time will come to an end at some point in the future, maybe the near future, so we need to be ready for that. At that point, all these truths about God's love for Israel and his sovereign choice of them will once again take top priority. God never gives up on his people or his promises to us, Jew or Gentile. That's awesome. And they are irrevocable. I love that word pertaining to God's power. It's a powerful word. It's a, a good word. The state can revoke your driver's license. Companies can terminate your employment at any time in many cases. But no one has the power or authority to revoke anything that God has authorized. Nobody has the power, only God. Our salvation is a gift and a call. By the grace and mercy of God, it will not be revoked. Praise his name. So then he goes, goes on to, to what I would call a position reversal, kind of try to understand this back and forth part. We have to remember that Paul is talking to us Gentiles here, and it helps the understanding of that. First, we were disobedient. Any arguments on that point? No. Romans 3.23 to you if you do. So, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all fall in there in that disobedient category. But now, because Israel was disobedient, God chose to show us mercy. Thankfully, nothing that we'd earned, mercy. We didn't get punished when we deserved it. We got mercy. Then in verse 31, in reverse fashion, now Israel is in disobedience, and because God has chose to show us mercy, he chooses also to show mercy back to Israel again. The bottom line is that we are all disobedient, but God is merciful. Galatians 3.22 sums that up nicely. It says, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That brings us to the resultant praise in verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. But that isn't the end of the sermon. We're going to keep it going here. Paul here can barely contain himself. Have you ever gotten to the point in understanding a scripture, maybe a prayer, uh, driving along, listening to a message, uh, something that somebody has said to you, a lot of different things where the Holy Spirit just fills you up so much that you might even weep, that you would feel the way Paul felt as he felt in this passage, just full of praise to God. 
I know that I have. And even in trying to convey this properly, I think we have so trivialized much of our language that we don't have any God-sized words left to praise God with. The words amazing, spectacular, fantastic, even awesome are so overused that God seems smaller when we use them rather than larger. That's why I like this passage because it, it uses some different phrasing here, how the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to use in these last few verses. First, the depth of the riches is not a phrase that we use maybe at all. Anybody use that phrase lately? Depth of the riches? No. But it conveys a great meaning in it for that very reason. Think of the volume of gold that would fill Challenger Deep. And I had to research that a little bit. Challenger Deep is at the end of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean over by Guam. The Challenger Deep is about 36,200 feet deep, if you can imagine uh, an ocean depth that far down. It's almost seven miles deep. It would be enough gold if you could fill that whole area, I think, to buy maybe a world of everything, maybe 10 worlds. I don't know. It's hard to calculate that, but think of that much gold, that deep, a pile and, just, and then th- compare that to God's wisdom and knowledge. That whole pile is a pittance in comparison to God's wisdom and knowledge. And again, it's just hard to come up with an illustration that would help us to get our minds around how amazingly intelligent God is. And the same, uh, our tiny minds can't even come close to understanding everything that God knows. Not even close. And the same goes for calling his judgments and ways into account. Ridiculous. We should rather bow down and acknowledge him as supreme genius of the universe. Verses 34 and 35 continue in the same vein, using the reference to the Old Testament of Isaiah and Job. First, he mentions God's authority, and then his ownership. Both remind us of Job's story. So, And you remember Job's story. He went through severe trial in his life, severe. All of his family was killed. All of his livestock was killed. Everything was taken from him, including his health, sitting in a pile of ashes covered with boils. So that's Job's story, and he had a lament about it. He, He had a complaint. So he complains to God about, where are you, God? What are you doing for me? What What's happening here? Well... Uh, first of all, in, uh, Job, one of his friends, goes on a rant for about six chapters. But then, finally, God speaks. And he starts in Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Oh, so sorry, Job. Man, I feel sorry for you, buddy. Oh, no. No, he did not say that. He said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins, Job, like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And then he says in verse 41, or chapter 41, verse 11, Who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine already. God owns it all. It belongs to him, everything that we see around us, everything belongs to him. It's his. He's given us a stewardship for a short time, and he's going to call to account how we perform that stewardship of his things. So Paul has interjected, I think, a little bit of reverent fear here uh, at the end of this parenthesis about Israel. We would kind of think of it as, oh, this is this great praise festival to God, but there's a little bit of fear injected in here to say, hey, be careful about your attitude. Be careful how you think of me. God is awesome and powerful and owes us nothing. In Christ, he gives us everything, but all by grace, his unmerited favor. So finally, he wraps it up in verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. 
Amen. He says amen. I don't think it can said, be said any clearer or more succinctly than that. God has sovereignly chosen Israel and promised to bless them forever according to his holy will. He has made a place for us Gentiles, glory and blessing forever through Jesus Christ in the church. We will all together praise and worship the magnificent God who planned it and executed it all for his glory. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your glorious plan. We thank you for your amazing grace that has made a way for uh, all who will believe, of both Jew and Gentile, both. You have a marvelous plan in place. We look at it in awe to see how you work out every detail exactly according to how you want it to be. That includes only faith in Jesus Christ to make it into your heaven, no matter who you are, what race you are. We come through you, Jesus, only. Please grab a hold of our hearts as we walk this week. Um, Lord, for those that would not know you, Please, God, open that up to them to see that they need to turn to you, that they need to trust in you, Jesus, alone. And for this, those of us that know you, Lord, as we go out this week, let it be a priority for us to live in a way that would show others that Jesus Christ is the truth and the way. Lord, we love you and thank you for these truths that you've given us in your word. We are blessed because of you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.